More severe storms. More forest fires. More hotter heat waves. Oh my. <laughs> Climate change is getting real. And dramatic responses are in the air. All that and more on this episode of the Growth Busters podcast. Call in, call in, call in, call in, call in, call in. Call the Growth Busters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast, the podcast about one planet living. Here we discuss our society's addiction to growth, and we do our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth. For cutting edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, be sure to visit growthbusters.org. I'm joined today by my partner in growth busting, Grace Stark, who has a college degree in environmental policy and serves on the board of the Green Cities Coalition. Thanks for joining me today, Grace. Of course. My pleasure, Dave. Let's see. Right off the bat, the agenda calls for listener feedback. We really enjoy sharing your thoughts about both past podcasts and future podcasts. If you visit the Growth Busters podcast Facebook page frequently, we'll give you a hint about a future podcast subject and ask you to share your views. So be sure to follow that Growth Busters podcast Facebook page so that you can opinionate whenever you want. But also uh, after an episode, people share their thoughts, they send us emails, they make posts on the, the Growth Busters website and sometimes on Facebook. And so we try to share your thoughts when we can because we're interested in what you have to say. So there were a few comments on the website about our last episode, number 18, which was how fast is our goose being cooked? probably faster than you think, uh, in which we looked at a critique of the ecological footprint analysis behind Earth Overshoot Day, which was August 1st, in case you've forgotten. Grace, let me share with you a couple that I thought were worth Absolutely. taking note of. First of all, Brian Sanderson. Thank you, Brian, for commenting frequently. It's nice to know you are paying attention to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Brian wrote, of course, footprint estimates are an incomplete metric. From the point of view of a hard scientist, they're also fuzzy. But so what? If estimates of human population are not enough to carry a rational argument to explain that which is plainly obvious to any rational being, then why should we expect some other number to do the job? My point is this. We don't live in an age of reason. Darn. That's my editorial comment. There. <laughs> Humanity never has. Most vote with their feelings about what they want and how they wish things should be. Indeed, I have to wonder about the Associate Professor of Sustainable Development who wrote the critique. He says, since the Industrial Revolution, the world economy has grown dramatically. Overall, this is a success story since rising incomes have lifted millions of people out of poverty. End quote. And then back to Brian's comment. Well, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the human population has increased by almost 7 billion. So if only millions have been raised out of poverty, then billions have been born into poverty. And yet the Associate Professor of Sustainable Development calls this a success story. It's not. It is a failure of civilization. It's a failure of reason. And sustainable development is an oxymoron. Well, I'm always keying in on oxymorons, and I think, unfortunately, the way we are practicing sustainable development, he's probably right about that being an oxymoron. So I'm not going to argue with just about anything Brian had to say. Oh, I think it brings up a lot of interesting points, and it's one of those things where I feel like we're trying to find sort of a way of uh, still having a large number of people and, and, and being sustainable, and that's where that term comes from. But there's more behind it than just, you know, it it's the tip of the iceberg. And he's raised a lot of really interesting points, actually. Yep. And if we have time, we're going to return to that topic of sustainable Absolutely. development a little bit later. Meanwhile, from the UK, we got a great comment from Bill Dowling. It was great because he said, great program all around. We always love those compliments. Definitely. Thank you. I particularly appreciated the Global Footprint critique. Apart from making no allowance for the depletion of non-renewable resources, the Global Footprint Network makes no allowance for the biocapacity required to support wildlife. So it is no wonder we are losing other species at rates 1,000 times the natural rate. No doubt the 2018 WWF Living Planet Report will once again tell us how much more they have been depleted since 2016. 
It is a great shame on them that while they go into great detail on all the effects on wildlife, they never ever clearly explain the obvious causes to all the avid readers of their otherwise excellent report. Too many of us. Great points, Bill. Global Footprint Network has definitely been pretty upfront about the fact that they are cautious and that they do not include space for wildlife. I don't know if you knew that, Grace, but they don't include space for wildlife in their evaluation of whether we're exceeding biocapacity. I actually didn't know that, but now that I'm thinking of it, they didn't really mention that when we were discussing it in the report we read. So it's nice to kind of absolutely touch on the Global Footprint Network and uh, just kind of reassess the way that they do things. And it's good to hear that our readers are paying attention, or our listeners rather, are paying attention to that. And you know what? I got to say, I didn't get a chance to read this email, but I think just this morning in my inbox was an email from the Global Footprint Network with a link to uh, something they've written about the ways they're working to improve their methodology. So as we said, they're constantly right. They're constantly working. And I think that that's a good point to make because that's something else that you were saying that they there's definitely room for improvement on sure. and that perhaps they can bring that into play in the future. Yeah, maybe so. Last comment I want to share. This is from Karen Gaia Pitts, who really took exception to my frequent mention of using a condom. I bring that up frequently. I think I kind of use it as a symbol of uh, contraception. Uh, But anyway, she wanted to remind us that over a 10-year period, the chances of getting pregnant with average use are, I'm just going to highlight a few of them. She gave me a long list, and you can find them at growthbusters.org if you want to see the full list. But If you're just using fertility awareness, there's a 94% chance in a 10-year period you're going to get pregnant. If you're just using withdrawal, 92%. Those aren't too surprising. Condom, though, is just only a little better at 91% for a male condom and 86% for a female condom. So that's 91% chance of pregnancy over a 10-year period. And that might astonish you. Well, the reason is because it's average use, because... There are a, uh, a lot of people out there who don't use these correctly. <laughs> you know, they make balloon animals out of condoms right. instead of well, putting them with them where they belong. Well, for the example. condoms that were in the little cute animal boxes that you were showing me are probably much better quality. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. Well, quality may be an issue, but I think, but really it's <laughs> but, just, no, yeah, yeah it's, it's user skill exactly. and, and, and that kind of thing. And I meant to look it up and I forgot to, but perfect use, if you use it properly, the odds go way, way down. So it is potentially much better. But Karen raises a good point that in average use, it's not that great. And the pill, 61% chance. In fact, my first wife, the mother of my two children, she was on the pill both times that those kids were conceived. I actually know someone who had, well, I think there was maybe like a skippage happening between the time that they took their last pill and were able to get a new prescription. But that being said, I'm sure that happens a lot. And I have a new family member because of that. So (laughs) there you go. There you go. But anyway, way at the top of the list, there is, uh, well, male sterilization. World Vasectomy Day is coming up in November. So we'll probably be talking about that in the future. Of course, that's pretty much irreversible. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. So that'll be a good topic. Yeah. A very fun topic to discuss. Uh, Female sterilization, there's a 5% chance of getting pregnant in a 10-year period with female sterilization. So who knew? Karen goes on to say, so in the 30 years that a woman has to worry about getting pregnant, if she is not ready to permanently give up childbearing, her chances of getting pregnant more than once while using the pill is quite high. And on the condom, even higher. I myself got pregnant twice on the pill and once while using spermicides and withdrawal. So, It is best to quit promoting condoms, she scolds me, if you really want women to have fewer children. Poor women cannot afford these long-acting reversible contraceptive methods, and that is why in 2011, poor women had an unplanned birth rate nearly seven times that of higher-income women. Did you know that? I didn't. Yeah. Interesting. Fascinating. And I haven't fact-checked Karen, but Karen uh, works on this issue pretty uh, robustly, so I don't have any reason to doubt her stats. In 2016, she wrote, women in households with an income below the poverty threshold had the highest birth rate at 78 births per 1,000 women compared to 44 births per 1,000 for women at 200% and above the poverty threshold. 
The real answer to lowering U.S. fertility rates, instead of telling couples to have fewer children, is to provide universal health care with free, effective contraception and the necessary counseling on using it. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate her honesty as well with her personal um, points that she's brought up. And I will say, did she say in there, actually, she's talking about certain populations are unable to afford other forms of contraception besides condoms? Was that, did I read that correctly? Well, I think if she didn't say that, she certainly implied that. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's a big one. And that's one of the reasons why, I mean, some of these programs are really important where we do put our dollars into programs to make other forms of contraception available to teenagers in the U.S. For example, Colorado's had a great program. Because the pill isn't the most convenient, the condom isn't the most convenient, mm-hmm. certainly not the most effective. So the more the more we can give people the chance to use more advanced contraceptives, the better. That's true. And I mean, I, I will say, and this is kind of putting myself out there a little bit, but I don't know if it's different state by state, but I did have Medicaid for a while, and I was actually able to get birth control pills for a dollar. That's good. And that was part of that. So granted, that's something that's, you know, taxpayer dollars go towards that. But that is technically something you qualify for when you're a poor student. Well, I'm glad (laughs) to hear that. And it would be better if you qualified, if you had the choice of some of the more effective contraceptives. Yeah, that was nice. But I will say that. And, you know, it's a really great return on investment because for every unplanned pregnancy that we prevent, the cost of preventing it is pretty low. The cost of the contraception is pretty low compared to the cost of all of the socialized costs right. of taking care of, of a, a new of a, a new, new human. Yeah, <laughs> right. <you got> it. <laughs> so having a hard time figuring out how to say <laughs> what that. those things that we are that <laughs> yeah. Homo sapiens. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. There you go. All right. So that's it for our listener feedback today. Don't forget that uh, we love to share your comments. So feel free to comment on the website at growthbusters.org or on the Growthbusters podcast Facebook page or on Twitter where you can follow Growthbusters. So, main story today, Grace, is Hurricane Florence. It hit the U.S. coast September 14th. Fortunately, it had downgraded to Category 1 by the time it hit the coast, but it still caused significant flooding. It was a big event for the Carolinas. absolutely. Yeah, and what caught our attention uh, was a story in the New York Times on September 18th, headline, It's Back, Underwater Yet Again, The Carolinas Face a New Reality. One of the things I noticed in the article was that they referred to the flooding that's happening in the Carolinas and what they're experiencing with these extreme weather events as the new normal. And I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, Lord, that's... We talked about that. That's concerning. <laughs> so Yeah, and we talked about the fact that James Hansen, the famous climate scientist, says, no, it's not the new normal. It's just we're passing through that phase. It's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, this is not the end-all, be-all, believe it or not. So yeah, yeah. Yep, but good point. What caught my eye was that well, first of all, the history that the reporter, let's see, there were three reporters, Jack Healy, Richard Fawcett, and Campbell Robertson, and they pointed out, let me just read from the story. Hurricanes have long been a fact of life in North and South Carolina, with nearly 500 miles of coastline between them. But the last four years have been particularly punishing. An unnamed weather system that drew moisture from a hurricane in the Atlantic paralyzed much of South Carolina in 2015. Hurricane Matthew arrived the next year, drenching the Carolinas and leaving dozens dead. And now Florence, which has dropped more than 8 trillion gallons of rain on North Carolina alone. Now, there's a geography professor at the University of South Carolina, Dr. Susan Cutter, who's quoted in this piece, and she's director of the Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute. And she told the reporters, this is something that these areas may have experienced, but not with the constancy that we see now. And even Governor Roy Cooper of North Carolina told them, when you have two 500-year floods within two years of each other, it's pretty clear it's not a 500-year flood. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, I had that's... <laughs> that's Duh. It's pretty, it's pretty clear. Yeah. So this story just, I think, did a pretty good job of just underscoring the fact that we better get used to it. This is it. Climate change ain't the future, baby. We're living climate change today. Yeah. One of the things that I kind of noted as well was the people that live in the Carolinas, they don't want to move. It was uh, Mr. Barnes that said, let me see if I can locate his full name. Bobby Barnes Jr. It was Mr. Bobby Barnes Jr. Uh-huh. And he'd actually rebuilt his his home after uh, the 2016 storm. And every time they have to leave, his kids are constantly asking, when are we coming back? So the people that live there already want to keep coming back. They know that this is happening, but 
maybe not to the extent. And there was also a point that was made about people are moving to the Carolinas by the thousands still, apparently. And actually, on a personal note, my in-laws have talked about moving to the Carolinas. I have to maybe talk to them and see if they're thinking of reassessing that at this point. But it still is not making people you know, want to avoid the Carolinas. Yeah, we still tend to kind of look at these events as aberrations. Yep. And that's why this story is so important, is it's driving home the point that it is sort of the new normal. If you want to include this and worse is the new normal, then I would be willing to admit that. And uh, let's see, there was also in the story uh, a Dr. Kerry Emanuel, a professor of environmental science at uh, MIT, who uh, said that there's evidence that the occurrence of powerful storms is particularly likely to increase in places on the margins of the tropics, like the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. Very places that people don't really think they're moving into harm's way if they move there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it'll take five years or 10 years or 20 years of this before people start to say, ooh, and I think, think twice about that. What did you think about the part in the in the article that was kind of talking about the North Carolina lawmakers forcing the state and local agencies to make policies on the coast to ignore the models that predict the sea level rising? Because I was going to say to you when you said, we don't know if it's five years or 10 years. Well, there's probably models that would predict that, that would act as a guide. But it looks like that that's sort of being pushed off and saying, well, let's not pay attention to those models. And that's concerning. I think. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's sort of my favorite, unfavorite paragraph in the story. It's so ironic that the states that are suffering these impacts are among the fastest growing in the country. And the reporters here wrote, the Republican-dominated legislatures have been accused of prioritizing business and growth over efforts to limit the consequences of climate change. Mm -hmm. So they are reaping what they are sowing. Right. Sadly, sadly. Absolutely. And I kind of had this sense, and I made a note that they would almost rather keep building and allowing people to move there in the name of money rather than admitting that there are potential risks that are going to be increasing most likely yeah. over the years. It's turning a blind eye to something that's going to hit you in the face with gallons of rain. <laughs> totally on the money there. I thought kind of related was the idea that the world is finally waking up to climate change. There was a story in The Guardian headlined, World is Finally Waking Up to Climate Change. And uh, it was interesting. Let me just read a little bit from the first paragraphs, Grace. The scorching temperatures and forest fires of this summer's heat wave have finally stirred the world to face the onrushing threat of global warming, claims the climate scientist behind the recent Hothouse Earth report. Following an unprecedented 270,000 downloads of his study, Hans Joachim Schellenhuber said that he had not seen such a surge of interest since 2007, the year the Nobel Prize was awarded to Al Gore and the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change. Let's see, here's a quote from him. I think that in the future, people will look back on 2018 as the year when climate really hit. This is the moment when people start to realize that global warming is not a problem for future generations, but for us now. Wouldn't you say, yeah, ditto? Yeah. Right, ditto. And I think that it's refreshing to hear that this is in article form, that this is something that it's it's pretty clear that according to this author, Jonathan Watts, that this is, it's more at the forefront than it's ever been. And I think that in part, um, bringing back Florence is in part responsible. These major weather events have really kind of forced people to wake up and pay attention. Yeah, and there'll be more, of course. And I thought it was interesting that this uh, scientist later in the piece was quoted as saying, Politicians prefer small problems that they can solve and get credit for. They don't like big problems that, even if they succeed, leave the rewards for their successors. But once you pile up public pressure, politicians find it hard to avoid taking responsibility. So he's optimistic that the fact that the world does seem to be acknowledging it, we're talking about it, we're certainly seeing it linked to these major weather events in the reporting like it's never been before. Mm -hmm. He's hoping that's part of a building public pressure so that even, even those pitiful policymakers will have to finally start doing something serious about it. I think when you're pressured by the people that uh, <laughs> elected you, technically, then it, it brings more of an impact. Maybe. Right behind pressure from the people that gave you campaign money. That too. Yeah. I think we've been racing through this fast enough that we might be able to share a few other odds and ends from current events. What do you say? I think that sounds good. Okay. Now, I don't want to break my long string. I think every podcast since episode 13, I have mentioned single-use disposable plastic straws. 
I managed to find an excuse to bring those up. (laughs) And it's so funny because it is such a downstream little somewhat insignificant thing to do. And that alone will never give us sustainable lives. That is not one planet living. It is a tiny part of it, as uh, as I harp on all the time. But I did want to share a couple things. We first discussed it in episode 13, Downsize Me. So if you're joining us late in the string of podcasts, you may want to go back and listen to that to get the uh, the background on it. But I just wanted to mention, Grace, just twice in the last two weeks, I have been served drinks at a restaurant with a paper straw. A paper straw is like it was in paper and then you open it and it was plastic or the whole straw is paper? No, the straw is paper. Oh, okay. It's just like the old days before you were born, straws were made of paper. (laughs) They do sell those in the store though. And now they're considered fancy straws. (laughs) You can get them at like Michael's and you only put them in your drinks if you're, you know, yeah, if you're feeling, if you're feeling real fancy that day. (laughs) So episode 13, you hadn't joined us yet. Dana Hickey was co-hosting and we had this great conversation and we talked a little bit about that. I think in fact that restaurants where there was a need for a straw, a paper straw, It's recyclable, it's biodegradable, so it's a lot lower impact than a single-use disposable plastic straw. And I hadn't seen a paper straw in years. So I am definitely seeing evidence that restaurants are converting rapidly. And now, of course, I got those straws because I forgot on both occasions to ask the waiter or waitress not to bring me a straw. I still forget sometimes. That's a great point because presently, as a server where I work, I talk to a lot of other servers and they say, I just don't put straws in people's glasses right off the bat. And they've seemed to have a lot of luck not getting pushback from customers saying, can I have a straw? However, when I attempted to do that, I got a, can we have three straws, please? (laughs) And I, I was just like, okay, all right. Well, yes, of course you can have straws. So it really is nice if guests, customers actually tell you, hey, can I not have a straw? Can I don't need one? Yeah, but I confessed to Dana in that episode that I really do, if I'm getting a Coke, I really like sipping it through a straw. So I told her I had these reusable, rigid plastic straws that I can run through the dishwasher, Mm -hmm. but I never remembered to take those with me when I left the house. Uh, And so until this whole plastic straw campaign developed this year to really ditch the straw, Mm -hmm. it just hadn't really been on my radar screen. And so I was complaining to Dana, well, it is real pain to take one of these straws out of the house, you know, take it to a restaurant, put it in a Coke, sip through it, and then you've got this sticky, wet straw. What do you do with it? And Dana said, well, you know, Dave, I've heard that they have a reusable straw that you can fold up and that it uh, is a keychain. And so... Do you have one? I ordered one, Grace. That's amazing. So that's what I have right here. Let me open it up. Wow. So there it is. It's steel. It's washable, (laughs) reusable, and it's collapsible. Okay. Now, here's the deal. This is called the final straw, and I'll include a link to this as well as some other recommendations for reusable straws for those of you who uh, are interested in doing that. And of course, I failed to mention, we'll also include links to these stories that we've been talking about in the show notes. But I haven't used this yet, Grace, because, well, I thought I should probably clean it before I use it because it was Mm -hmm. probably just put together in a factory. And it's interesting, what's inside the steel is uh, like surgical tubing, food grade. I noticed that. I was tubing. Yeah. And that's what allows you to have joints in the steel that won't leak. Right. But it makes it kind of challenging to clean. How do you clean inside that tube? I was wondering about that. Yeah. And so with this straw in this little kit, there is a uh, kind of a squeegee on a string thing that you can pull through the straw to clean it. Problem is, I haven't been able to get it out. (laughs) I can't get it out of that case. And I got no instructions. I'm waiting for an email back from the lovely people who came up with this idea. Please tell me how to get that squeegee out of the case so I can clean my straw. And then I'm going to try it out and I'll report back on what it's like to sip my root beer or Coke through this straw. Maybe you need some tweezers. But I'm looking forward to giving it a try. But I just wanted to share. Let me know how that works out. I'm curious. Yeah, it's kind of exciting. And maybe I'll actually get used to it because I'd rather not. I mean, it's silly, but I just... My preference would no, be not to give up the straw. It's really cool because I had heard about those too and I wasn't sure. And I don't know if maybe there's different brands of them too. Did you find 
any different websites that offered them or anything? No, I only found this one, okay. and the cl- Collapsible, and it was actually even on a Kickstarter. I think it was a Kickstarter campaign, oh. and they were saying we'll be able to start delivering these in November, and yet I was able to order it from Amazon in September. That's amazing. So I'm a little confused about the timing on that. Oh, guys, Christmas presents. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's Every, an idea. Everyone yeah. in your family would love this straw. You know it's true. I'll give you the link to the uh, Kickstarter campaign and the uh, product on Amazon in our show notes. And if you go to the Kickstarter campaign, they've got a couple of videos. that. There's one video that shows you how to clean it. But in the video, <laughs> the little squeegee's already poking up way out of the mm, container. They I think, cheated. I think that maybe that was supposed to be poking up and <laughs> you, yeah. you got one that it wasn't. <laughs> maybe so. Maybe so. Okay. Anyway, enough about plastic straws for this episode. Next up. In our last episode, episode 17, called Trump Can't Keep It Up, economic growth, that is, uh, I made the point that economic growth exacts a price on our life-supporting ecosystems. It's unsustainable, and it's unwise in our state of overshoot. And I know that comes as a shock to a lot of people because we worship economic growth, and all of the media uh, and all of the politicians around the world give us this steady diet of grow, grow, grow. You can't get elected if you aren't promising economic growth and job creation. But well, I'm going to promise you a guest on a future episode. We will invite Brian Check, the president of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, to join us and educate us a little bit more about why Uh, It's just not sustainable. But I wanted to bring it up today, Grace, because there was a recent World Bank report called What a Waste 2.0, a global snapshot of solid waste management in 2050. And according to that study, we're on track to be generating 3.4 billion tons of waste every year in 2050 versus the 2 billion tons a year today. They're talking about municipal solid waste, and that's almost a doubling. Almost. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'd like to share with you real quickly what the senior director of World Bank Group tells us in this World Bank YouTube video, What a Waste 2.0, everything you should know about solid waste management. Let's play that. Without urgent action, these issues will only get worse. Here's what everyone should know. First, rapid urbanization, population growth, and economic development will push global waste generation to increase by 70% over the next 30 years. So I think it's noteworthy that, first of all, World Bank properly attributes this projection to both population growth and economic development. I told you we'd return to the subject of economic development. But nowhere do they recommend doing something about population growth or economic growth. They offer a number of other kind of downstream things. I mean, we can certainly manage our waste better. Right. We talk about that a lot. In fact, mm-hmm. one of the ways we can do that is by stopping Straws. the use of single-use disposable right. plastic products. But it's too bad that they don't also say one of the ways that we can avoid this future is by having smaller families and by getting over this public policy obsession with economic growth. Right. Of course, there are a number of poor countries in the world that are developing and higher rates of economic growth are expected from them. And that is really what economic development is. Mm -hmm. And we can't really begrudge them that. They really have a right to rise up to the level of the overdeveloped world. But of course, if they do, then our goose is definitely cooked. Right. And I also think that when you hear people in um, leadership positions, I think that some of them, it seems, tend to be hesitant to say anything specifically about smaller families. I think that that kind of, you know, raises a lot of questions from a lot of different people and and it's something that they tend to shy away from. Yep. That's definitely a third rail, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm trying to constantly make it okay to talk about that. Poke it in a little bit and here and there. Yeah. (laughs) Every chance I get, every chance I get. But interesting, and that kind of leads into our next story. On the subject of the unsustainability of economic growth, I already mentioned Brian Check, president of CASI, the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. He's the guy who really educated me about the fact that perpetual economic growth is not only impossible, but it's in direct conflict with sustainability and with environmental protection. The first book that he wrote was Shoveling Fuel for a Runaway Train. And if you can find that, it's a short read, and I can still highly recommend that. But he's written other books since then. But interesting news about Brian is that he recently sent a letter to the top 10 environmental NGOs challenging them to a debate. 
And the debate would be, is there a conflict between economic growth and environmental protection? What he is telling them is that their mission of environmental protection is impossible when the overriding domestic policy goal is economic growth. And he claims that there are leaders of a few NGOs who have claimed there's no conflict between environmental protection and economic growth. Mm -hmm. And then there are many NGO leaders who just have remained silent on the issue. You definitely don't hear much about it. Most of the environmental NGOs are trying to get you to pressure your policymakers to move to renewable energy, eliminate plastics from the ocean, save the rivers and all that. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah, you get that. You get all that stuff. Uh, So Brian Check sent that letter to top 10 NGOs, and it'll be interesting to see whether he gets a you know, response. response from any right. of them, but good on him for trying to make headlines with it, if nothing else, and nicely encourage them to put this on their agenda. It needs to be on the agenda of every environmental NGO. Yeah. We've got to get weaned off of that myth that we can grow forever and that our prosperity is dependent on perpetual economic growth. Yeah, if I had to give my opinion on that, I would say that I absolutely think that there is a conflict between the two. I think we saw evidence of that in uh, when we talked about the change to the laws governing the beach development in the Carolinas. Uh-huh. Because they want to build more to bring people in, but if they build more to bring people in, that there's going to be more issues and and they're also building and obviously damaging the environment because of that. I think that alone kind of shows that off. I would say that definitely there's a conflict. <laughs> in fact, wouldn't you say that now that we're kind of past the denial stage of climate change, mm-hmm. uh, I think we're over that. But the thing that's keeping us from really ramping up our efforts to really meet the goals that we need to meet in order to avoid climate catastrophe, the, the one thing that's stopping it is that we are still not willing to give up economic growth. Mm-hmm. If any solution retards economic growth, Right. It's, it's off the table. It's tossed out the window completely you, to the point where you actually have, you know, p- people being told, you know, hey, let's ignore these climate models. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, any, anything because economic growth trumps everything. Yeah, I don't know what good it does you to have economic growth on a dead planet. It, I, I don't think it does, but I don't think that they can see yeah. the forest for the trees. Yeah, and so shame on all those policymakers out there, except for one, <laughs> <laughs> and that is a guy who was until recently the environmental minister for the country of France. Let's listen to just a brief moment from a radio interview with France's environment minister back in August. Je ne veux plus me mentir. Je veux pas donner l'illusion que ma présence au gouvernement signifie qu'on est à la hauteur sur ces enjeux-là. Et donc je prends la décision de quitter le gouvernement. Aujourd'hui. Vous, 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 aujourd'hui. vous êtes sérieux là Oui, je suis sérieux. That was France's most popular cabinet member, Environmental Minister Nicolas Hulot, stunning everyone with a surprise resignation on a live radio interview in late August. And what he said, in case you don't speak French, was, I don't want to lie to myself anymore. I don't want my presence in this government to be taken to mean that we are doing enough to tackle this challenge. The climate was what he was talking about. Now, this resignation surprised even French President Emmanuel Macron, who happens to be a former investment banker, and he's been really pushing a pro-business agenda, even though he has been pretty vocally supportive of carbon reduction goals for Mm -hmm. for climate change as well. But that's in some ways a little more talk and a little less action. I was going to say, I know like one of his statements that he's he's quoted as making is, uh, make our planet great again. (laughs) <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so. Mr. Ulo said he was unhappy about the lack of action by the government on restricting pesticides, reducing greenhouse gases, and the erosion of biodiversity. Now, I don't know because I don't live in France and I don't mm-hmm. read the French press all the time. I don't know how, whether he had been really vocal about the conflict between economic growth and right. environmental sustainability because that would be huge if he was. Mm-hmm. But there was a television program, I think it's called The Debate on France 24 Television, where they talked about his resignation. And and the journalists in this conversation, I think there were a couple of journalists and a filmmaker having this conversation, and they spoke about this conflict between economic growth and sustainability as though it was just a common subject of discussion in France. 
Hmm. And if that's true, it wouldn't surprise me because the Europeans do so many things better than we do in North right. America. That would be actually impressive if that was something that was normal for them, their new norm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It needs to be our norm. <laughs> yeah. But even if it wasn't all about economic growth, I got to kind of give a pat on the back to former French environment minister, Nicolas Hulot, for you know standing up for principle. You just don't see that happening every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's all I've got. What do you have? I was just looking at it and doing some thinking, and we've kind of already said this, but it says in a quote, France is doing more than a lot of other countries. Do not make me say that it is doing enough. It is not doing enough. Europe is not doing enough. The world is not doing enough. That was uh, Yulo saying huh? that. It's a shame that he stepped down. And I understand because he had to go by his principles, but I think that his presence in that government might have done more good than bad. You know, and I do understand he said, I think, and so I am deciding to quit the government. And I I can understand that. But at the same time, it's in a way I wish that he hadn't. I wish that he was still there to push those issues. I wasn't going to bring that up, but I'm glad that you did. Yeah. And thanks for sharing those further words of his. And in fact, this the whole subject of whether he was doing more harm than good by quitting his post was actually discussed at length in that program, the mm-hmm. debate that I told you about. And I will put a link to that show because it's on YouTube. I'll put that in the show notes too. Excellent. And that's in English. So, you know, that's a really good question. Some people did beat him up saying, we need somebody as committed as you, even if it's frustrating to keep yeah. hammering away from inside. Now, on a much smaller scale, if you'll remember in the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, one of the things that we followed was the story of yours truly, Dave Gardner, superhero of the green sustainability movement, running for city council in Colorado Springs in 2009. And I was not elected. And my mother's neighbor was one of the county commissioners. And I remember a conversation with him. And he said, well, Dave, do you think you'll run again? And I said, well, I don't know. First thing I got to do is finish this film. And he said, you know, I think you might be able to accomplish more from outside than you ever would from in. That's a good point. He said, I'm giving up government, but he didn't say that he's giving up on the environment. Yeah, I don't think he could. Right. I mean, this is if, a guy who was a Green Party candidate, and he's got a long history as a yeah, strong so, environmental advocate. So I'm glad you saw that, yeah, because he might be doing the same thing. He might be doing more from the outside and feel like he doesn't have to worry about the red tape. Yep. I hear you have a great close for us today, Grace. I was just going to say, just with some of the smaller things that, and the smaller steps that people can take to be more um, environmentally friendly and sustainable, I've gotten a little bit of a response when I've talked to friends and family on them, just kind of saying, you know, these are so small. Do you really think they're going to make a difference? And I, I don't know. I feel like I've maybe said this before, but I really feel like we can't get in that mindset that the little things that you do are not going to help. I think that's kind of an unhealthy mindset. You have to think that everything you do makes a difference. And you have to keep thinking that recycling is going to make a difference, that you you can throw that toilet paper tube in the recycling bin versus just toss it in the easily convenient trash can and things like that. And I think I've gotten a lot of pushback, and I might have said this as well, on the plastic straw thing. And I know we're talking about it again. I'm so sorry, but (laughs) I can't help it. I just feel like you have to kind of push yourself and you have to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm not insignificant and this really could make a difference in the long run. And you're going to help other people see that if you keep doing it yourself, you're going to set an example. I think at the risk of sounding kind of corny, just don't give up. (laughs) Keep trying to do what you think is right, even if other people around you are telling you that it's not going to make a difference because it does make a difference. If you decide your individual actions aren't going to make a difference, then Multiply that by 325 million other people in the U.S. Or multiply that by the 2 billion people in the overdeveloped world. Are those 2 billion people going to do the right thing, even though it's small? Or are they going to do the wrong thing? And you multiply even just one plastic straw a day. You multiply that by a billion. Mm -hmm. The sheer weight of that many plastic straws, it will astound you. Yeah. So there there is power. So if you aren't willing to make that one small move, then how can you ever expect everyone else to do it? Right. Exactly. It's it's essentially being the change you wish to see, (laughs) which sounds terribly corny again, but it's just, it's just in a nutshell, still doing what you think is right, even though other people around you might be giving you pushback. Yeah. It's important for your soul, if nothing else, but it's also important when it's multiplied by millions or billions. So exactly. thank you. 
great clothes. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of another exciting episode of the Growth Busters podcast. Be sure to visit growthbusters.org to explore these issues and find the show notes for this episode with links to all the interesting studies and videos that we talked about and we'll see you next time some may dream to paint mountains and streams but not me I'm a growth buster some may just want more but don't know what it's for but not me I'm a growth buster Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather But no, not us, we are the growth busters Calling, 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 calling